Up next, with this month, September, being Dementia Awareness Month in Australia, we thought we'd bring you the story of a daughter learning to say goodbye to the mother she once knew and hello to another one. Here's writer Beth Spencer with Forgetting. The year I lived in a camper van, it was deep into winter before I discovered that outside the front of my 90-year-old mum's assisted care residence was a great place to park my van and sleep. In the old days, this would be called a home. Nowadays, they've dropped the pretense. A residence or facility is, after all, more accurate. Because it's not your home, is it? That's the thing you closed the door on and gave back the key forever, or your sons and daughters did for you, best not to mention it. Memories of my grandmother pleading at each visit, I want to go home, take me home, and my mother stealing her heart saying, this is your home ma, crying in the car afterwards. On my first night, One of the staff heading out at the end of her shift catches me sliding open the door of my van, holding my hot water bottle and toothbrush. She's fascinated, delighted with the little cupboards and shelves, the stove and sink, the inverter to charge my laptop, the lush deep blue curtains, the skylight and vent. She loves the brightly coloured mat, loves the silky bedspread and cushions, the gentle glow of the reading lamp. I take her delight as permission. A good quiet street and facilities not far away in my mum's private room. Perfect, really. By 9pm, all the ladies and the gents, mostly ladies, but some gents, are tucked up in bed and the fog of drug-assisted milky sleep drifts out and envelops my van on the curb. I sleep like a baby like a child in the back of the car with a parent at the wheel. In the morning, my mum glories in the chance to play hostess, providing bathroom and toilet, then getting out her china cups and filling them with hot water from the hall. We breakfast at her little table. In the afternoon, I lie on her bed and she carefully adjusts her tartan rug to cover my feet and then stretches out in her recliner, and together we have a little nap. Later, we take a walk before dinner. She plants her two hands firmly on her roller walker, wearing her aviator sunglasses, fawn trench coat, and burgundy hat and scarf, she ploughs determinedly up the streets. Hey, lady, a man concreting a driveway calls out. Careful you don't get booked for speeding. After dinner, we play a game of backgammon. I've heard my mother say she used to get down on the floor and play games with her children. If she did, I don't remember. Or perhaps it was just with the older ones, before all the spaces in her life filled up with children and work and there was no room anymore for frivolous things. I teach her backgammon strategy, which is new to her, and her competitive streak comes out. It's a fight to the death. I cough and hint when she is about to miss a chance and her fingers hover, wiggling slightly, her brain processing the cryptic information. Sometimes I subtly touch a piece with one tip of a finger and she lights up, pouncing with glee. But the rest of the time I play hard, no molly coddling. We become increasingly dramatic and noisy and she beats me by one and I groan and sweep the pieces up like a bad sport, and we laugh. We have a cup of tea, and I sit there, quietly stunned that I had such fun with my mother. Some days she's okay, but other times, when she gets anxious, watching the clock, for instance, so she doesn't miss a meal time, her mind forgets to think in sequence and goes around in a loop. I've learnt that if I resist the loop, it can become enormously irritating. But if I flow with the spirit of it, see how many different ways I can answer the same question, 
preferably with increasing enthusiasm, then time shudders and stops and we start to float in an eternal now. It's as if the universe inside my mother's head regards my replies as so fascinating they are worth repeating again and again until I too start to see something extraordinary in the texture of the sentences and the intricate building of that bridge between my experience and hers. Gradually we weave a little deeper into the heart of what we are saying until we start to perform something beyond words, a dance. Sometimes I just tell her stories, things I know of her childhood and mine. She listens with a look of wonder and joy as half memories flit across and fly off. Fascinating stories, the most fascinating story in the world. One day, after an hour of this, she sits holding my hand and looking out the window. Then she turns to me and says, So tell me, where did we meet? On the day I hug my mother goodbye, knowing I'm heading north for a long time, I get a surge of feeling, a deep transfer of emotion, a special mother love beam that penetrates to my marrow. I think, she's old. I may never hug my mother again. This may be the last time. My sister and I have talked about how different it is for us now, that the more she detaches from her old life, the more she forgets and lives in the present, the more words strip away, the more we're able to feel this pure mother love in a way that's quite new, or so old perhaps, from some prehistoric fluid time that we've forgotten, a time before symbols and words. I think of when I sold my house in Creswick and closed the door for the last time, wandering around the garden one last time, suddenly bursting into tears. All the bittersweet in life, all the departures into new worlds. She poses in front of the open side door of my van and I take a photo, a good photo, the kind she likes, hair neatly combed, face full to the camera, and then we reverse and she takes one of me. She hugs me again for a long time and then stands with her roller walker at the gate, refusing to go in until she has seen me leave. She didn't sign out, and I hope she doesn't wander off. There's a fierce look of determination on her face as I drive away. I can still feel the imprint of her heart on mine. You've been listening to Earshot and Forgetting. That was written and read by Beth Spencer, based on a poem from her recent book, Vagabondage. Producer was Claudia Taranto with studio engineer Marty Peralta.